This video is an introduction to the Dynamic Aggregate Demand Aggregate Supply Model. Uh, the model originates from Tyler Caron and Alex Tabarrok's textbook, Modern Principles. What I want to do here is provide an overview of the model for students taking my courses. Um, I hope that it's also useful to those who haven't taken my course as a background material, um, but I should stress that this is intended as a complement, not a substitute to looking through the textbook. The reason why I like the model is because it's a relatively simple framework um, for allowing students to understand the impact of various economic shocks and also to think through some potential policy responses. The basic model looks something like this. Uh, the most obvious difference between this dynamic model um, and the traditional one is that we're looking at rates of change instead of levels. So instead of showing the price level and the real GDP on the two axes, we're looking at inflation and real GDP growth. I think this immediately makes the graph more accessible to students. We live in a world where inflation and growth are the main economic indicators that are discussed in the news. Inflation targets are 2%. Recessions are defined as two quarters of negative GDP growth. Students can instantly draw upon their knowledge of the economy and utilise the model. As you can see, there's three main components. The solo curve, which I've drawn in blue, the aggregate demand curve in black, and the short-run aggregate supply curve in red. And we're going to look at each of those in turn. So to start off with, we'll look at the solo curve. This derives from a solo growth model. Um, it's telling us what the potential growth rate of the economy is, which we'll label Y star, given the existing real factors of production. In other words, Y star is a function of A, multi-factor productivity, K, which stands for capital, and L, which stands for labor. Depending on the raw inputs that we have, this will determine the potential growth rate we can achieve, which is Y star. This also makes an assumption that prices are perfectly flexible. Um, but Y star is telling us um, what we will see with existing real factors and flexible prices. Given that Y star is independent of nominal factors such as inflation, we're going to show it as a vertical line. Real growth is driven by real productivity, and this is demonstrating the classical dichotomy. We can also have a think about what's going to cause shifts in the solo curve. Things like weather, wars, strikes, um, changes in R&D, innovation, infrastructure improvements, competitiveness, um, supply side policy generally, such as education or training, making the labour market more flexible. All of these things are going to affect our variables A, K and L. Possibly they'll make capital better, might mean that we have better labour, might mean that we have better combinations of capital and labour, but they will all determine what Y star is. Um, let's imagine that we have innovation, for example, an increase in innovation. This constitutes a positive real shock or a positive productivity shock, and it will cause the solo curve to shift outwards. And let's imagine that this is going to be at Y star equals to 3%. The second component is aggregate demand. The definition of aggregate demand is combinations of inflation and real GDP growth that's consistent with the specified rate of spending growth. Now we're going to derive this from the equation of exchange, which says that M plus V, or money supply growth plus velocity of circulation, is equal to inflation plus real GDP growth. M plus V equals P plus Y. Now that equation of exchange is also the equation of the aggregate demand curve. Um, we've got the variables P and Y on the two axes. If we rearrange that equation, then we'll see that the aggregate demand curve is downward sloping, and indeed it has a slope of negative 1. I've drawn it here such that total spending is equal to 5%. We're just going to assume that M plus V is equal to 5%. Given that M plus V is equal to 5%, and we've already said that Y star is equal to 3%, this must mean that inflation is going to be 2%. Every single point along this black line is combinations of P and Y that sum to 5%. This is just a mathematical identity, there's no economic intuition behind it, and it's relatively straightforward. We can imagine different combinations, for example, if inflation is 4%, then on this aggregate demand curve it must mean that the real GDP growth rate is 1%. Um, if the real GDP growth rate is 6%, then this implies a deflation rate of 1%, i.e. negative inflation. Every single point along that black line sums to 
Causes of shifts are simply going to be anything that causes a change to M or to V. If we think of M as being the money supply, then it's relatively straightforward to think about how changes in central bank activity will cause M to shift and therefore aggregate demand to shift. It might be worthwhile talking a little bit more detail about what constitutes causes of shifts in V, in the velocity of circulation. Um, so if we return to our original equation of exchange, M plus V equals P plus Y, um, one way we can think about V is simply by defining it as anything that changes aggregate demand other than changes in M. Now this seems like a bit of a cop-out, but if we split total spending up into its various parts, for example, we have household spending, i.e. consumption, business spending, i.e. investment, government spending, which we denote as G, and net foreign spending, i.e. X minus M, then anything that's going to cause changes to these other than M is going to be captured by what we refer to as velocity. So for example, we can think of wealth shocks. Um, if there's an increase in wealth, if people feel wealthier, then this is going to probably cause consumption to go up. We can think of confidence. If confidence is higher, then um, consumer confidence and also business confidence um, will change. If a government engages in a stimulus package, then this is going to cause G to change. Uh, tax changes are going to affect disposable income, so that will affect C. And then also we can think about the demand for money. Um, traditionally, central banks would use the money supply to conduct their monetary policy. It's more common now to think of central banks as trying to affect not the supply of money, but the demand of money through the interest rate. And we can see how interest rates are going to affect C, I, G and X minus M. Generally speaking, we'd expect an increase in interest rates to reduce consumption and investment, but changes in interest rates are going to affect the demand for money and therefore constitute a velocity shock. Now this all fits um, quite neatly um, into other models that we look at in macroeconomics. It's important to stress that generally changes in the growth rate of V are going to be temporary. An increase in consumption in this model implies an increase in the growth rate of C relative to I and G. Indeed, this demonstrates a weakness in fiscal stimuli because it's impossible for a permanent increase in the growth rate of G relative to the other variables. At some point, it's likely that an increase in G, one that leads to a positive aggregate demand shock, will at some point reverse itself and constitute a negative aggregate demand shock. This also implies that when a central bank reduces interest rates, this will be self-reversing. This reinforces the notion that changes in the growth rate of C, I or G do not change the rate of inflation in the long run. Given that shifts in velocity will tend to be temporary, ultimately it's only changes in M that can generate sustained inflation. One way to summarise this is we can just think of velocity shocks generally as referring to confidence and things that boost confidence will constitute a positive AD shock, things that reduce confidence, a negative aggregate demand shock. So we can put this on the graph. We've got a solo curve with Y star equals to 3%. We've also got um, our aggregate demand curve such as M plus V equals 5%. And this implies an inflation rate of 2%. Now let's imagine that the central bank um, increases the money supply such that M plus V is now equal to 7%. We could also model this as a velocity shock using the list of factors from the previous slide. If M plus V is now equal to 7%, there's been no change in the underlying factors of production. So if prices are perfectly flexible, Y star will still be 3%. But if total spending is higher, given the same amount of factors of production, this just implies that there will be an increase in spending on existing factors. This is going to bid up prices of those existing factors and would have a higher inflation rate. If M plus V is 7% and Y star is 3%, then we can see that inflation is simply going to be equal to 4%. The thing to note here is that a nominal shock, i.e. an aggregate demand shock, only affects inflation. What we've done is we've seen an increase in M by 2% or 2 percentage points, and the result is simply an increase in inflation by the exact same amount. We can also use the solo curve and aggregate demand curve to think about how uh, productivity shocks affect the economy. Let's imagine, for example, that we have um, the advent of 3D printing, and this is going to constitute a positive real shock. This is going to shift the, shift the solo curve to the right. Let's imagine it shifts it such that Y star is now equal to 
and we will move down the aggregate demand curve and the inflation rate will fall to 1%. To summarize, 3D printing, which constitutes a positive real shock, is going to lead to an increase in Y star and a decrease in inflation. We can also think about the impact of a negative real shock. Let's imagine a tsunami, for example. Um, a tsunami is going to destroy capital. It's going to reduce productivity. It's going to constitute a shift to the left in the solo curve. Let's imagine it shifts all the way back to 2%. We now move up the aggregate demand curve and assuming that total spending remains the same, then that 5% total spending is going to be split 2% real GDP growth and it must therefore be 3% inflation. So a tsunami or a negative real shock is going to lead to a reduction in Y star and an increase in inflation. Now this is essentially a real business cycle model and some economists would maintain that this is really all you need to understand economic shocks and policy responses. However, this all rests on an assumption that prices are perfectly flexible and it's worth looking into whether or not this is the case in the real world. The short run aggregate supply curve um, is the relationship between P and Y for a given expected inflation rate and what it's looking at is the fact that in the short run whilst prices adjust there may be a positive relationship between inflation and output and that positive relationship is shown with an upward sloping short run aggregate supply curve. The intuition here is, a, is what's known as a signal extraction problem. If inflation is running higher than inflation expectations then it means that revenues will be rising and it also means that costs would be rising. But if wages constitute a large amount of a firm's costs and if wages are somewhat sticky and they rise at a slower rate than revenue, then it means that that inflation is generating a bigger increase in revenues than it's generated than an increase in costs. This is going to bloat or inflate profits. And if profits are going up, then this is sending a signal to entrepreneurs to increase output. Hence, higher than infl expected inflation leads to an increase in output. The converse is also true. If inflation is lower than expectations, then we'd be expecting revenues to be falling and we'd also be expecting costs to be falling. But if wages are a large share of costs and wages are especially sticky and slow to adjust, then revenues will be falling at a faster rate than costs are falling. This means that profit will be going down and the signal is to reduce output. In a recession, we do see wages and prices fall, but typically not to the extent that would clear the market. The reason why the short and aggregate supply curve looks the way that it does is because we can see that below Y star is relatively flat. This is simply suggesting that wages are especially sticky in a downwards direction, i.e. workers are hostile to wage cuts. And we can see that the short and aggregate supply curve becomes very steep once we go beyond Y star and this is because there's an ultimately a limit to how fast the economy can grow. Hence, we have an upward sloping short and aggregate supply curve that's relatively flat below Y star, but then becomes quite steep once we go above it. Given the definition of the short run aggregate supply curve, which is relationships of inflation and real GDP growth for a given expected inflation rate, then the only real cause of shifts in the short and aggregate supply curve will be changes to expected inflation. And it's worthwhile looking at an example to see how this operates. So this is our basic model. This is what we've been working towards. And let's look at how it works in practice. We're going to demonstrate how nominal shocks have a temporary impact now that we've introduced a short and aggregate supply curve. In other words, if we accept that prices are somewhat sticky, then there will be an adjustment process by which we get to a new equilibrium. Let's imagine, as we did before, that aggregate demand starts off where M plus V equals 5%. Let's imagine that there's an increase in the money supply such that M plus V is now equal to 7%. In other words, we start at point A with Y star 3% and P 2%. We then shift the aggregate demand curve outwards to our new rate of 7%. And what we'll do now is move up the short run aggregate supply curve. In other words, the fact that inflation is running higher than expected, entrepreneurs are somewhat fooled into increasing output. And therefore, we have this increase in inflation and increase in real GDP growth. We get to point B. Now, point B must be temporary. It cannot be an equilibrium because at point B, in 
uh, Y star is real GDP growth is greater than Y star. This implies that there's capital consumption and this is unsustainable. And it also suggests that inflation is higher than expectations. At point B, the inflation rate is 3% and the red short run aggregate supply curve is consistent with inflation expectations at 2%. If inflation is running higher than expectations, then we may have the short run impact of A to B, i.e. short run temporary increase in output beyond potential. However, at some point if inflation is running ahead of expectations, expectations will catch up. Ultimately, we know that inflation must be 4% because if M plus V equals 7% and Y star is 3%, then we know that inflation is going to have to be 4%. And so we can see now the extent to which inflation expectations will adjust and there will be a process or a sequential process by which this happens. Ultimately though, inflation expectations will catch up with reality and we will finish at point C where Y star is 3%, inflation is 4%, and inflation expectations are consistent with reality. We can use this model to compare the real business cycle view, which essentially is that we move from A to C instantaneously, and a more New Keynesian or an Austrian view, which is that prices are sticky, and therefore we have this temporary phenomena whereby we move from A to B to C. Inflation causes a temporary boom um, and then falls back to reality. The last thing I want to do is just to look at a historical example. So we can look at the following data that surrounded the Great Depression. In 1929, inflation was 0% was, and real GDP growth was 4%. Let's imagine that this is consistent with the solo curve and that the underlying factors of production were consistent with 4% real GDP growth. So we have our solo curve, we can have an aggregate demand curve, this is going to sum to 4% because P plus Y equals 4%, um, inflation is therefore zero. This is reasonable because it's a relatively modern phenomenon to have sustained inflation and so if we introduce a short and aggregate supply curve, uh, it's reasonable to think that inflation expectations in the 1920s would be essentially zero. We can label this as the position, our starting point, which is 1929. Then in 1929, we have the Wall Street crash, obviously. This constitutes a large fall in stock prices, which is a negative wealth shock. And as we saw in a previous slide, a reduction in wealth is going to reduce consumption. Ultimately, this means aggregate demand falls. We also saw a contraction in the money supply, which is going to constitute a fall in aggregate demand. This leads to bank failures, a reduction in confidence. These factors are going to cause uh, subsequent negative aggregate demand shocks, further contractions in the money supply until ultimately we end up in 1932 where inflation is minus 10%, Y star real GDP growth is minus 13% and aggregate demand sums to minus 23%. We can make this model, and we can make this story a lot more detailed. We can factor in some negative real shocks what was happening at the time were bank failures, which is a reduction in financial intermediation. There was the imposition of tariffs. There was some natural shocks in terms of the weather, and this would constitute the solo curve shifting to the left. Um, it's unlikely to think that the solo curve shifted all the way to minus 13%, so perhaps Y star isn't minus 13. Um, actual GDP growth may be significantly lower than potential. We can talk about the policy responses which may be to try and boost aggregate demand and shift all the way back up to 1929, and the costs of doing that if the solo curve has also shifted to the left in the meantime. This can seem somewhat confusing because we can say that a negative real shock leads to a decrease in confidence, which then constitutes a negative aggregate demand shock. Similarly, we can say how negative aggregate demand shocks cause a bank panic, which then becomes a negative real shock. So both can cause each other and they can feed into each other, Obviously, when we're trying to explain historical incidents, it can become complicated quite quickly. But I think the dynamic aggregate demand aggregate supply model gives us a fairly simple framework to think those problems through and be a good starting point for discussion. If you have any questions or any feedback, please let me know. Thank you.